Welcome to workshop 15 on data structures and algorithms. In today's workshop, we'll be looking at the graphical data structures. At the completion of today's workshop, you should be able to understand the terminologies that are used to perform some operations in graphical data structures. You should also be able to describe and implement some basic algorithms to handle the graphical data structures. Another thing we will look at is the depth first search and the breadth first search. We'll be using examples to implement these two approaches. Let's start by answering this question, which says, why another data structure? Of course, we've learned the linear and the hierarchical data structure. And uh, we also know the reason why we introduce uh, the hierarchical data structure after, after studying the linear data structures. Let's recall that we discussed some of the reasons why we need to uh, implement the, the binary search tree. And um, let's also recall that array has many limitations. And one of these limitations is that if we want to perform operations such as inserting data item into an array of sorted data, we realize that the complexity is of the order of N. But the linked list came and reduced that complexity to the order of one. And, but the problem with the linked list is that if any operation such as that involves searching, the complexity will also be increased to uh, the order of N. And when the binary search tree was introduced, this challenge with the array and link list uh, in terms of searching and uh, uh, inserting data were reduced. So in that case, the problem of inserting data, which is of the order of N, was reduced to the order of one in binary search tree. And the problem of uh, searching for data, which is of the order of N in the link list, was reduced to the order of log N in the binary search tree. So if we look at this, we see that these two have the same efficiency for insertion and deletion. But there's a trade-off on um, the binary search tree, because in the binary search tree, we can see that it, it requires more references than we have in um, the link list. So this is one of the challenge, uh, some of the data structures we've discussed have. Then another uh, way to respond to this question is by using this graph. So this graph represents a social network. And if you look at this graph, you see there's links, connections between people that are here. And there are multiple connections between them. So then it also looks very complex to use linear or the, the binary search tree that we have discussed to represent this kind of connection. So let's try and see if we, it's possible to represent them using the, uh, the search tree. So if we represent this as a tree, you have that U is the parent of this, of Anne, Bill, Leon, Sam, and Tom. Then if we go further to represent this in a social network, we can have something like this, where Kim, is now a child node of Yan, Yu, and Sam. So this kind of representation is not possible because it violates the, the binary search tree properties. So in this case, this has failed. This binary search tree has failed to represent this kind of um, uh, graph. Another example is the transportation map. 
So if you have this transportation map and try to represent it with linear or the binary search tree. So let's look at what we can do in the next um, slide. So we want to represent that in the previous slide uh, using a linear um, data structure. So in this case, we can have a connect a station A connected linked to station B. And we can also increase that by linking other stations to it. But if we keep on doing this to, to a point of representing the graph that we have in the previous slide, it will get to a point where the complexity will become too much to an extent that uh, uh, we have multiple we will have multiple um, linear data structure coming into it. And those multiple data linear structure uh, will become too complex that it cannot uh, really represent a structure. So in that case, we, we need another data structure, which is capable of representing this kind of graph that we have seen in the previous slide. So that is reason, one of the reasons why the graphical data structure is introduced. So in this graph, in the graphical data structure is a kind of a graph that, that consists of nodes and um, edges. So, but the nodes can have many process, predecessors and uh, also many successors. So we all know what the node is like five, three, four, they are all nodes and the edges are the line that connects them. So with this, we can see, we can also see that this kind of graph is required to perform some operations, the linear and the three data structures are not capable of performing. Now, for us to implement the graphical data structures, uh, there are some theories that have been proposed to assist in the implementation of uh, the graphical data structures. So one of them is the uh, shortest path theory. The shortest path theory allows graph to traverse the path, but it comes with some trade-off between space and time. Then we have the Ramsey theory. So the Ramsey theory says that for any six people, either at least three of them are mutual strangers or at least three of them are mutual acquaintances. So this um, Ramsey theory is trying to say that, answer the question that how, how big must a structure be to guarantee that a particular property holds. There's another one, which is the graph coloring. Uh, the graph coloring theory says that no more than four colors are required to color the regions of the map so that no adjacent regions have the same color. So these are the three theories that we are introducing in this lecture. Let's give an example using the Ramsey theory. So in this case of Ramsey theory, we are representing the six people using these nodes starting from alphabet A to alphabet F. So now in this case, <clears throat> I will ask a question before we progress. And that question is, is it possible to find um, three mutual friends and three uh, mutual strangers were among four persons. For instance, if we only have B, sorry, A, B, C, and D, is it possible to find three mutual friends from these three, from these four people? and at the same time, find three mutual strangers among them. That might not be possible. But if you have six persons, then you can begin to think about the possibility 
of having three mutual friends and also have and also have uh, three mutual strangers. Okay, let's progress by representing those that are friends with the red line and those that are uh, strangers with uh, the blue line. So if we represent that A is a friend of uh, B and B A is a friend of C and also a friend of D, we can represent further by using the same two of these uh, lines from A to E and uh, F. So we can also progress by representing the blue lines, which shows that A doesn't know, B doesn't know who C is, and C doesn't know who D is. And we can also provide some lines that covers this area. So now, if you look at this line, we can form some triangles from these lines to connect three persons together. The first triangle we can form is that we can form a triangle from A using this line along this line to B and along this line to D back to A. So this says that this implies that the A, B and C are possibly mutual friends. Then we can also form a triangle from B going to C and going back doing, then to D and going back to uh, B, or we can say B, C, D. So in this case, we can uh, in, infer that B, C, and D are not friends or mutual friends. So this is the kind of representation we can use Ramsey theory to represent. So now we have to look at some applications in the subsequent slides. So the first application we we look at is the plan uh, is for planning a journey by air. Uh, we can use these to find the shortest distance between two cities. So with all the representations of the edges and um, <clears throat> excuse me the edges and uh, the nose. Uh, the nose, the cities are represented using the nose and the distance between them are represented using the links or the edges. So we can also use that to find the shortest route to visit all the cities of interest. And uh, it's also possible for us to use that to find the cheapest route. In this case, there might be a trade-off between the time it will take to get to the destination. And, uh, but that, that means the time might increase, but the money might, or the expenses might reduce. So this can also help us to find out if it is possible to fly directly from city A to city B, or fly indirectly from city A to city B. Then another application can be for the maze puzzle. So in a maze, you have um, some entrances and the exits. So but those, some of these entrances are, have, does not lead to the exit. Uh, some will lead with shortest path and some will have a longer path. So with this, we'll be able to find the path that is the shortest or even find the exit from the entrance. Another one is the cost, cost uh, prerequisites. So there are other applications that these other areas where this can be applied. Uh, first is the, the graph uh, based recommender system. <clears throat> Excuse me. Another one is the circuit board design optimization. It can also be applied in the probabilistic graphical model for translation and uh, for weather forecasting as well. So we are now going to look at some of these terminologies. Now we want to use two um, areas to as examples. First one is um, the social network. Then the second one is um, the transportation map. So in this case, 
we have the nodes. The nodes represent the users in this social network. And uh, in the transportation map, the node represent the stations. So talking about the edge, the edge connects two users together. So this is the edge that connects you and Tom together. This is also the edge that connects you and Sam together. In, in the transportation map, we can see an edge connecting E station E and station B together. So another term that we need to understand is the undirected graph. So for undirected graph, the edge comes without direction. So if you look at this edge here, you see that there's no arrow pointing at any direction. So this can be used in social network to uh, describe uh, friends in a social network. But for directed graph, the edge come, the edge come with a, a direction arrow. So if you look at this edge, it's pointing from Tom to you. So in, we can use this in social network to describe followers. We can also use that to, um, to discuss or describe a block function on a messenger app. And we can use that to describe one way or two ways traffic. So you can say that this is a one way traffic. But in this case of you and I, it can be a two way traffic. So the directed graph can also be used for cost prerequisite or for job arrange tax arrangements. And let's talk about the parts and uh, the adjacent vertices. Adjacent vertices uh, is referring to the connection um, between two adjacent, sorry, between two vertices. So if you have a single line connecting two vertices, so it is referred to adjacent vertices. So this can also be used in a, in a, a network, uh, um, social network where direct friends are connected. It can also be used in the transportation map where you can connect stations. Uh, I mean, where you can use to describe directly connected stations on the same route. There's another term, which is the path. So the path is a sequence of edge between two vertices. So if you have sequence of edge between two vertices, that is a part. So this can be used to describe link between friends in a social network. And it can also be used to describe the transit between two stations. And then next we have here is the degree. So the degree of uh, a vertex is talking about the sum of edges or the adjacent vertices. And in a social network, it can be used to describe the total number of friends on a social network. So for the, on, for the directed graph, the degree can be divided into two. One is the out degree and the other one is the in degree. So for the out degree, it refers to the sum of the living edges. In the case of social uh, network, it can be used to describe how many followers or how many people that you follow rather. In degree is referring to the sum of the entering edges. So in this case, you can use it to describe uh, the number of people that are following you. So if we use this as an example, you can say the in degree, uh, the term, the sum, uh, and, and the yen, because they are all pointing at you. And then one, the next one we have is the weighted graph. So in the case of weighted graph, each edge is assigned a value. So in each edge, either uh, directed or undirected graph, 
each edge is assigned a value. So this can be used to represent the distance between cities uh, to find the shortest part between two cities. And another example where this can be used is in the electricity capacity of a cable. It can be used to represent the, electric, the electricity capacity of a cable, which, which can help to uh, manage uh, the power flow. So we further say that the weighted graph is also used for shortest uh, part planning and uh, its variance. So let's start with the diagram at the left-hand side. This diagram represents a city, which is an island with seven bridges. So the people in this city wants to know the possibility of one of someone walking across all the bridges just once, and um, exactly once, and uh, returning to the starting place or the place where he started the journey. So to solve this problem might be very challenging, but if we uh, reduce the problem to a graph, then we might be able to solve the problem or find no if the problem has a solution or it doesn't have a solution. So we have a question here which says, how many vertices and edges do we have for the graph representation? So like in this case, we have represented the graph at the left-hand side, uh, the diagram at the left-hand side into a graph. And at this point, we represent the yellow ribbons to be the vertices. So we have seven vertices here. Then we represent the lines with the blue uh, lines. So these blue lines are referring to the edges. So if you count them, you will be able to know how many edges and how many vertices. So to represent a graph, we can do that using different methods. Or in this uh, lecture, we are going to discuss two different methods that we can use to represent a graph. So one of these methods is the adjacency matrix representation. In adjacency matrix representation, the, mat the graph is represented as a two by two volume matrix, where uh, each cell has value for column and rows. So in that case, when the column uh, has a link to the row, then we represent the cell using one. We represent the cell with one. But if there's no link between the column and the row, then that cell is represented with zero. So there's also a different case where we have the edges uh, assigned, the edges are assigned uh, weighted values. So in, if there's any weight between the edges, uh, sorry, any weight assigned to the edge between two vertices, then that cell is assigned that uh, value of the weight, sorry, the weight value. But if there's no weight assigned to it, then the cell is assigned infinity symbol. To explain further, we represent the vertices with a, a vector, which is a one dimensional vector, and represent the edges with mat, mat matrix, which is a two by two dimensional matrix. So, so the, the next slide we explain, we show us more example of what we need to understand. Now, let's uh, explain this using undirected graph. So this undirected graph has vertices starting from A to L. So we can find the A to F as a one-dimensional vector, which is the A to F here and A to F here. Then at this mat inside this matrix, uh, we can 
inside the square matrix, we can think about the values for the edges. So if there's a link, which is the edge between two vertices, then that edge will be represented as one. But there's no link between two vertices, so that uh, cell will be represented with zero. Now, there is no link between A and A, so we represent it with zero. Or there's a link between A and B, so we represent it to one. There's no link between A, C, A, and D, A and E, and A and F, so they are all zero. Then if we move to B, there's the link between B and A, so it's represented with one. There's no link between B and B, it's present, so we represent with zero. There's a link between B and C, represented to a one. There's no link between B and B, represented with zero. There is also a, but there's a link between B and E, so represented with one, but there's no link between B and F, so it's represented with zero. So this is how we're going to continue until we get to the last point, which is F and F, okay? So now let's continue. Okay, there is a question which says, what is the efficiency in terms of the degonization of insertion and deletion of vertices and edges? What is the efficiency? What do you think is going to be the efficiency? Okay, I'll give you a clue. Um, the efficiency, one thing you have to understand is that we are representing this in matrix. And that matrix is a uh, N by N matrix. So you will realize that this value is going to be a big annotation of the order of V, or in this case, N raised to power two. Okay, then that's, that, that would go for both the insertion and the deletion. But the point is that you are traversing two, two different uh, uh, directions. Then let's have these for directed graph. So in case of directed graph, it's similar to the previous one, but not the same. So in this one, our consign is on the direction and not on the link. So if there's a direction between two vertices uh, on the edge that links two vertices, then we have to represent that cell with one. But if there's no direction between the two vertices, uh, the edge that links two vertices, then we have to represent with zero. Let's have a further explanation of what we mean. Now, there is no direction or edge from A to A, so we have a zero. Or there is an edge between A and B, with an arrow moving from A and B, so it is represented with one. Then the rest of these ones, there is no direction or link, so they are represented with zero. If we move to B, there's no direction between A and B. There's a link between A and B, but there's, the arrow is not moving from A to B. So we have to represent from B to A, sorry. So we have to represent this with zero. So likewise, there's no arrow moving from B to B, so it's zero. So there is an arrow moving from B to C, so we represent it with one. Okay, so this is how we're going to continue until we get to the final one, which is this F to F. And uh, we also have asked a question, so what is the efficiency in terms of the big notation of insertion and deletion in this case? I'll leave the, this, this one for you to answer. Uh, knowing fully well we are working on directed graph and the directed graph is still under the adjacent match adjacency matrix so you try and see if you can get the correct answer to this question 
or if you don't, you can also discuss this during the tutorial section. Now let's have a look at this case where we have weighted graph. Remember a weighted graph is a graph where all the edges have assigned uh, weight. So in this case, we, we uh, because we don't have any arrow moving from A to A, we assign infinity. But if in, in a case where we have an arrow moving from A to B, and the weight is six, so we have to assign six. So there is no arrow moving from A to C. This is C. There is no arrow moving from A to C. Then we assign it infinity. But there is an arrow moving from A to D, and the value of the arrow is three. So we assign three to it. And the last one on this row is there is no arrow moving from A to E. So we assign it this infinity. Okay. Now, what can you talk about the pitfall or the limitation of the adjacency matrix representation? What do you think are these the limitations? One of the limitations, uh, like we saw in the previous slides, is the issue of space demand but a demand for space. Another limitation is that it often goes for uh, spa. So uh, these are some of the limitations. More limitations will be discussed in the next slides. So these are observations, which uh, some of them are still, uh, can also be called limitations. Uh, the size of the graph need to be known before time or in advance. It, can, it cannot uh, store duplicated uh, edges. And uh, if, to uh, determine if, if there is an edge from uh, vertex X to vertex Y, we will take the time of the notation one. So if you want to know if there is any edge between uh, vertex X and vertex Y, it's hard to pick a bigger notation of uh, time uh, one. Then another thing is that uh, if the graph is spa, okay, then a significant part of that such as CNC matrix will be empty. That is one of the problems as we said earlier. Then for undirected graph, it uh, becomes uh, uh, symmetrically around the diagonal. And then lastly, we have that the insertion and the deletion has the open edge, has the, the time uh, uh, complexity of the notation of one. Okay, and that of the undirected graph requires two insertion or two deletions. So now the question we have here is uh, exactly the question that we have solved. Uh, alien, you just want to refresh your memory. And the question says, what is the space consumption using an adjacency matrix or representing V uh, or elements? Then let's now look at another method for representing uh, a graph. Uh, yeah, this is another um, uh, method to represent uh, the graph. Uh, in this uh, adjust, ad adjacency list representation of um, vertices and the edges, uh, it's just like a set of uh, singly linked lists with one SL, with one singly linked list for uh, each vertex. Uh, and um, each of these singly linked lists contains all the vertices. Uh, that are adjacent to the vertex. And then a single link, a singly linked list or an array is used to store the vertices. So now we have a question here that says, what is the space consumption 
uh, using using an adjacent list representation. And uh, what is the cost of the trade-off? We can also, uh, we also have a, a reference to the properties of the singly linked list. The, in terms of uh, the space consumption, yeah, if you look at this critically, you realize that um, uh, the space consumption will be at the order of uh, n. So this, this will give you a, a kind of an idea of the space consumption. If, um, if you want to uh, search for any item, then in this case where we are talking about the space consumption and we want to uh, relate it to the, uh, the vertex and the edges, so in that case, then it will be of the order of, of um, V plus E. So the V plus E, e are referring to the elements and the, the links. Now let's represent, um, represent the, use the graph to represent the adjacency list. So in this case, we are using undirected graph. So like we said earlier, we said that um, each of the linked lists contains all the vertexes that are adjacent to the vertex. So for instance, A, we have that A has an adjacent to B. So you have the link contain link to B. Then B has adjacent to C, it has adjacent to A and it has adjacent to E. So B has a, C, and E. Likewise, uh, C has to B, to E, and D. So this is B, D, and E. Then D has, is adjacent to C and E. We have D to B, to C, and the E. So we continue like that until we get to F, which is only adjacent to, uh, to E. And um, in terms of the big O notation of insertion and the deletion of vertices and edges, where V represent the vertex and the E represent the, the edges, what do you think is going to be this solution? Okay, let's continue. Uh, for insertion, we know that what we're going to insert, we're just going to insert in at the head of the list. So in this case, the insertion is going to be the big O notation of the order of uh, N. So, but for deletion, we need to transvert the locate the element that we want to delete. So in that case, the uh, big O notation is going to be the order of uh, E, where E is referring to the edges. So let's look at some of the observations of uh, the adjacency list. Now, one of them is flexibility, flexible to use uh, in terms of it's easier to insert and delete any vertex. Uh, another thing is that it's allowed for duplicated edges. It also um, used for underrated graph where each edge is stored twice. And then um, the, space, the space efficiency is for another thing uh, because of uh, how the it is to the presentation of spar graph. And, uh, if you, if, if in an event where we want to determine uh, if there is an edge between vertex X and vertex Y, then the search is going to require uh, the big notation of the order of uh, the vertex, which is represented by V. And in such in something is only going to be of a big notation of one. And uh, this the reason is because we're only going to insert at the head of the list. 
or the deletion is going to take the big O notation of the order of uh, E, because we need to traverse through the list before we will locate the vectors. Here is a, a table representing the properties of uh, the mark matrix and the link uh, uh, list um, adjacency representation. So in all these, we have explained majority of all these in the previous uh, section. So in terms of the space, it's going to be of the big notation of the order of uh, uh, V squared. And uh, that of the least is going to be the big notation of V plus E. So for vertex insertion and vertex deletion, they are the same for the matrix, but um, for the least, they are not the same because in the insertion, excuse me, for the insertion, you only insert at the edge, but for deletion, you need to turn back. So that is for the uh, vertex. And in terms of the edges, if you want to insert edge or delete an edge on the matrix, or even uh, look for the, for the edge, then they are going to be of the order of uh, one. Or in the case of a list, there are some differences. The difference in insertion and uh, the difference in deletion, which is similar to what we explained here, because we need to insert, if we want to insert, we just insert at that point, or if we need to delete, we need to search to locate the item, sorry, the edge that we need to delete. Now, this is um, a, a graph representing the depth first edge. The depth first edge traverses as, as deep as possible um, until you get to the dead end. So if you look at this graph, this is the starting point and it traverses as deep as possible until you get to the deepest one, which is this uh, node. So it is until you get to the deepest one that you can now uh, backtrack to find another path to follow. So if you look at this place, you get to the deepest path track and find another path here to follow. This is what the the depth first principle uh, follows. So it does not pan out, but it goes, uh, it traverses as deeply as possible. So, but the breadth first stage literally to be an opposite of the depth first stage. So instead of traversing as deeply as possibly as possible, it uh, finds out, what I mean is that it is not traversing as deeply as possible, but it is going to visit all the nodes that are adjacent to it. So it goes to an adjacent vertex to find out in the same way. So that's how it continued going and it moved to another uh, vertex and found out. So if you look at this A, it finds to B, C, and D. And it moves to C, it finds to uh, E and G, sorry, F and G. And A goes into that way. So it keeps running out until you get to the, uh, to the end. So now uh, let's talk about more about the depth first set, the basic algorithm. So the depth first set, uh, we visit, visit is also known as process, all the vertices descendant before moving to the adjacent uh, vertex. So if you look at this one, it goes to the vertex descendant. This is the vertex descendant. A has a descendant here, and it keeps on going that way until it gets to the end. So it doesn't find pan out. Now, um, this is an algorithm to represent the 
depth per search. So in this algorithm, first we have to uh, initialize all the nodes as a unvisited, such that the nodes will be processed one by one. Then the, the, the first node is pushed into the stack and marked visited because it has been processed. So as long as the stack is not empty, then the loop will start. So the loop will start by popping the vertex up uh, from the stack. And for each adjacent unvisited stack, it pushes uh, the uh, vertex into the stack and mark that as a visited. So now um, you remember that in the, um, the diagram we showed in the previous slide, we saw that in the case of depth per search that it traverses from the vertex to the parent, sorry, to the descendant or the child vertex. And it keeps going as deep uh, as uh, deeply as possible until you get to the dead end. So any of these that has been visited, it doesn't need to visit it anymore. Uh, you just need to and use it to backtrack. So that's why it has to mark, mark it as a visited. So that might be other reasons why they need to be marked as visited. But in this case, they not need to any any node that has been visited has been processed. Uh, so that node that has, has already been processed, I doesn't need to be processed again. So now let's have an example to represent this uh, depth per search. So in the depth per search, we push A to the stack and then we can push uh, B. Then we, from B, we can have C and uh, E. So then we can also have E, D, and that point where we have popped, uh, popped E. Then when we pop F, D, we have C, F, then have C, G, H, C, H, G. Then to visit seven, we need to pop H. Then before we visit G, we need to pop G. And the last one is uh, C. So in this case, our depth first set could be represented as A, B, C, D, F, G, H, J, C. But how do we make this look a bit unique? We can make it look a bit unique by following this pattern. So in this pattern, we are using the edge table. So in the case of the edge table, we have the vertices represented on, as a, a column in this column. So all the vertices starting from zero to seven are represented with this column. Then we have the adjacent to each of these vertices. So now what we're going to do is that we have to start visiting this adjacent and we use the tick red line to show the path that has been taken at each stage. So for instance, we have to visit zero on the zero, we have to mark that zero has been visited in each of these um, edges. So even when we have zero at this point, we have to mark it that it has been visited wherever it is. Then from zero, we can move to any of these ones. It could be six, two or seven or five. So when we go to two, we also need to mark that two has been visited. So in this case, two is canceled here and two, two, two is visited here, but canceled at this place. Then the next place where we need to go can be, uh, we can go this way, which is six. So if we go to six, this is the location of six, but well, we have marked two already. So we have to mark six wherever we see six here. Okay, this six is marked. Then we can move to another position, which is four. So along four, 
we have already marked six. So the next place where we need to go is to either move to three or move to seven, then or move to five. For which, what would help us determine where we will move to? Remember that we have canceled all these ones and what are we have left? We have left three has not been visited, five and uh, seven. So we can visit, we can visit three. When we visit three, we have that this three has been visited. So we have to cancel it anywhere they appear uh, in, the, in the vertex. So the next point is that we can visit five. So at this point, we have, we have four already, okay? And we have three here already. So, and the only thing we're going to have at that point is uh, uh, we have to backtrack to uh, four because we have visited this zero already. So backtracking to this, we can go to seven. And at this point, we see that what is left is only one and one is visited and that's all. So the uh, DF algorithm processes the start vectors and after processing the start vectors, it proceeds to all its descendants. And the one that is done, it picks one of the, or the first descendants uh, and process all its descendants again. The descendants are referring to the adjacent vertices. So this is how it follows going until it gets to the end. So let's look at the algorithm. So the algorithm is first, you assume that each vertex uh, is marked as not visited. Then you have to start by in queuing the vectors into the queue and then um, mark that as a visited. So why queue not empty? As long as it's not empty, we have to dequeue the vertex of the queue, then process the vertex. Then for each of the adjacent unvisited vertex is added into the queue and also marked as visited. So this is uh, the point and you you can tell why those places are marked as visitors from your knowledge or what you've learned so far. Now let's have an example to illustrate this. So in this case, we are using um, the queue. So we can queue A into uh, uh, queue A. Then we can also queue from B A, we can now to B because A is uh, has an adjacent vertex uh, B. So now from A to B, B has adjacent vertex uh, adjacent vertices uh, C and E. Likewise, uh, E and uh, C has adjacent vertices E and B. So and then the from there, we can uh, queue, queue E to have B and F. So at this point, you can queue F and uh, uh, queue in H and G. And finally, we have G and H, and G is the last in the list. Now, this, we can also make this to be in a unique form. Uh, to make it be in a unique form, I can represent them using this table, so, which is similar uh, process that we took when we were using the depth first search. To this, we have to uh, define some conditions that will be helpful. So one of the conditions is that we can use the, a red line to show that the part has been taken in uh, at that stage. We can also use the double line to show the available part to be added into the queue. Then we can use a um, dotted line to indicate uh, that part can be avoided. 
because a part that is linked to that vertex has already been added into the queue. So let's now proceed. So for instance, if we uh, take the part that links zero to two, uh, we can indicate it using the red tick line. So now another part that zero can go to is uh, the part uh, of uh, zero to five and uh, we can queue it and uh, can also go from zero to seven. Then if you look at this, you see we have dotted line between uh, seven and uh, four. So this is because since the edge between five to four is already keen into the queue. So we can avoid this, uh, this part. So then we have seven in the queue and we continue this operation that way by going from five to three. And if we go to five to three, we can see at this point that this link between here and here has dotted line and link between here and here has dotted line and link between here and here has dotted line. It's because those parts can be avoided. And the next part that is available is this part. So in that case, we can add, so is this part and this part. We can add five and uh, uh, four. So from four, we can add one. Then the remaining ones are, can be avoided because there are already links that uh, connect that have been taken, which are related to them. 